Hello, I'm Tone Lanzillo, and this is Climate Duluth. Climate Duluth is a series of conversations with people from Duluth who are engaged in and working on various issues in regards to the environment and climate change. Uh, today, I'm extremely pleased to have with us Stina Myra and Kayla Lobbins with the Minnesota Public Interest Research Group at UMD. Uh, welcome. Um, why don't you start and just tell us a little bit about MPERG and some of the projects and initiatives of the organization. So MPERG, Minnesota Public Interest Research Group, as you said, um, we've been around since 1971. We work on issues regarding economic, environmental, and social justice. Um, so we've done a lot of things. The first major thing that kind of kicked off MPERG was um, getting the Boundary Waters to be a paddle-only zone. And a fun fact actually is there are PERGs, as they call them, around the country, and MPERG was actually the first one. So there's PERGs, there's WISPERG, there's Cal per there's lots of different ones. There's also a US perk. So we're really excited to have kicked off a movement of student activism and uh, nonprofit work. So it's been really fun. Okay. What are some of the projects and initiatives you're working on, say, this year at UMD? So every year we do a really big get out the vote campaign. So every fall. Um, this last fall we worked heavily with the local elections and then this upcoming fall we'll be focusing on the pre the presidential elections and everything. Um, and so a big part of civic engagement is just like getting out and voting and a lot of people when they come to school they're 18 years old they don't have their parents there they don't have anyone telling them what to do or why it's important so it's really important for us as a resource on campus to give them the information they need to be able to vote because it can be a complicated system if you've never experienced it before or if you don't know what's going on and don't have someone there because you're already just trying to navigate this new life so voting is a big thing that we work on we also um, have worked a lot with the homeless persons bill of rights and loaves and fishes community here in Duluth um, helping with um, last year getting the warming centers for the first time right. and um, this year there's been some really awesome stuff happening with that um, but then for social justice aspect side of things, um, we've done a lot of work with um, other organizations on campus with like RAC and doing like menstrual drives or um, social justice has also done like clothing drives and stuff um, that we've donated to CHUM. And just, we really like to work with groups on campus, but also really trying to get out in the community um, and really building those relationships with community connections and groups. Oh, cool. What are your, both your roles with MPERG? I'm the assistant organizer. Okay. <clears throat> so I basically assist, you know, with anything that she needs. I go with her to like the community meetings and things like that. Um, but I also do a lot of on the ground organizing. <clears throat> so I'm very closely working with the task force leaders for each of the task forces and making sure that they have what they need to do the programming that they're doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I know you've been an important liaison with the Duluth Climate Mobilization yeah. Initiative, yep. which is greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and what's your role? And then I'm the directing organizer, <coughs> so um, really everything under the sun. So working on um, working on our finances and our budget and doing applications for getting funding every year and working on um, a big events that we have coming up and really like my main focus is really trying to be that community connector so connecting like the task force leaders with different groups in the community and trying to get people out and engaged um, so the affordable housing coalition is something that MPRG is a a part of and so the last couple meetings I've been able to bring people from our um, democracy and economic justice task force and being able to like connect them with people in the community and so last year as the assistant organizer uh, Mary Franz really was instrumental in helping me build those relationships so now I'm kind of I have them and so now I'm working on being able to connect other people with those resources and getting them in inspired and just trying to let people know that they're are big things and big goals that we can have, um, as well as doing like smaller, smaller events and small right. goals. It, like we can think big, and there are people in the community that want to work with us, and we have lots of opportunities through that. It was the reasons either of you joined Emperor? Yeah, why did you decide to join this organization and get involved? I joined mostly <clears throat> to get involved on campus. I think that was my first, my first reason. But very quickly, I got involved in the activism side of it. And it kind of changed the course of like 
my school career, I guess. Um, I was a biology major, and now I'm an environment and sustainability major. I spent my first semester in MPERG as a general member of the Environmental Task Force, and it kind of all went from there. And then I was a task force leader the next year, and then I met you, and we did the first summit, and now I'm a staff person. And you're still here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Um, and I joined MPERG initially because I saw a poster on the wall for a group with free pizza and environmental justice. And I was like, well, I'm an environmental science major. This makes sense. Also free pizza. Um, and I showed up and immediately it just felt like the place that I belonged. And it was really nice, especially coming from a super small town, because I understood kind of like environmental justice and environmental issues around climate change and things. But I had never, I don't think I'd ever heard the term social justice. And I didn't understand um, a lot of intricacies that come from being in a big city, because like in my small town, we, I never saw a homeless person ever. And I never, like most of the people, either um, issues were like buried deep down. And so I didn't really see a lot of things going on. Um, but coming to like UMD and being a part of MPERG really exposed me to like the reality of a lot of people's situations and like why it's important to say our pronouns and why it's important to fight um, for racial equality and different things like that that I just had never been exposed to before. So I really, um, a lot of the growth for me that's happened the last two years um, being, well, two and a half years now being involved in MPERG has like growth that I've had through the university has been facilitated by MPERG and by the leadership and people having honest conversations with me and helping me to learn and grow. And so I hope that I can help facilitate that with like young leaders coming in and just showing them like why these things matter and also just trying to inspire, like going back to my small town and having real and honest conversations with my parents and with my friends. And so MPERG has been really like just a key part of who I've become and where I see myself going in the future. Okay, and what's your major? What are you studying? I'm an anthropology major. Okay. And yep, so I have an environmental science mi minor as well, and then I'm doing a museum study certificate program. Okay, uh, I'd like to spend a little time talking about this upcoming environmental summit. And so tell us a little bit about it as far as its goal, purpose, just, yeah, what your plans are for the summit. So this year's summit is Our Planet, Our Future, There's No Duluth B. It is the second annual summit, and um, we're just really excited based on last year's attendance and involvement from different groups. It's really just a way to allow connections to happen between people and give people the, um, the tools they need or the inspiration they need to be able to go out and affect change. So it's really about just bringing everyone together in order to um, make them feel powerful and give people a voice and an opportunity to be engaged in a conversation that is affecting everyone. Um, and so this year we're really excited because um, we've already gotten a lot of responses from speakers confirmed and everything and we're really working on reaching out to groups right now to coordinate getting a full a full house of tabling because the first hour of our environmental summit is um, just a tabling and networking time so last year we had 30 plus groups that were there um, and it was really awesome to be able to have the opportunity so students and community members could come and see like here are the groups that are working on things here are the different different avenues where you can get involved because not every environmental group is for is for the average person. Everybody has different specialities and different things that they're good at. And so it's important to have like a variety of groups to see the ways in, west, in which you can best get involved and best affect change. Hmm. What are some of the groups that you know are coming or that you hope will be there this year? So um, we have Equilibrium 3 is gonna be there. Uh, we also have uh, Duluth for Clean Water and the NAACP is, um, we're going to have a speaker, Stefan Witherspoon, is going to be there, which is really exciting. Um, and then we have Libby Bent from Duluth for Clean Water is going to be there. Gary Anderson from the city is going to be there as well. Um, from the Sierra Club, we have Jenna Yakel. And Dudley Emerson is a well-renowned <laughs> photographer and author um, that is... Um, he is a, initially not from Duluth, but he moved to Duluth because of um, the nature and has been really involved um, in getting people of color outdoors. Um, and so we're really excited to hear from him. Uh, Tone, you will be speaking at the summit, and we are really, really excited to have you this year. Um, 
Yeah, uh, we just we have a lot of groups coming and we have a lot of um, excitement for the kind of things we're going to hear from our speakers. Okay. What do you hope comes out of the summit when you think about the end of the day? Well, yeah, what are your hopes for the summit for the future? So I really, the main goal for me is just to see these, to see the connections blossom and to see people um, getting involved and initiatives started. Um, so like last year, for example, coming out of it um, with like knowing that you were going to go and do your walk from Philadelphia to DC, just like having more people be being inspired by other stories and being involved and just being able to see those connections and see people going to those groups and getting involved. It's just really about um, inspiring people to take action and taking action through the city and trying to implement goals for Duluth and get the ball, like keep the ball rolling and doing more um, for our community. Okay. Uh, logistics, date, time, location. Tell us a little bit more about, yeah. So it's going to be on March 26th, and it's going to be from 3 to 8 o'clock. So we're going to start um, up in the Kirby Rafters at UMD, which is right by the Kirby Ballroom. So that's where the networking will be happening. And then we'll transition into the ballroom um, after that networking for some opening speakers. Um, and then after the speakers, then we're going to go out into breakouts. Um, so we did breakouts last year, which was really wonderful because it's a way for the community members to directly be um, engaged with each other and having honest conversations. So the breakouts will have different themes. Um, and then part of the breakouts at the end, we will be giving questions so that every group for the last 15 or 20 minutes are all talking about the same um, topics and maybe just like what do they want to see changed in the city or what's important to them or what issues have they seen um, so then we can all kind of have one coming together even though we're all in different breakouts and then coming back and we're gonna have dinner and um, then we're gonna have our final speakers and we're really just excited for the day and to be able to um, have those breakout discussions too because it's really awesome to come and listen to speakers but giving people a break and a chance to really connect because it's all about those connections as I said and really that networking and giving people the inspiration and the voice because sometimes it's easy to go and listen and like this is why this is important or these are the issues but being able to talk about those and to um, communicate about those with with your fellow community members is really important. So trying to facilitate those conversations and giving people a chance to practice talking in a safe space because when you're having a conversation with maybe somebody that doesn't think climate change is real or why should I care about this or why should I do something, it's nice to be able to practice having those conversations where it's comfortable and it's safe and then being able to go out and use that in the real world to affect change and explain to people that maybe don't believe. Okay, cool. How do people find out more information about the summit as of now, and is there any cost or fee to go? So um, if you want to find out more information online, MPIRG at UMD, our Facebook page, M-P-I-R-G A-T-U-M-D, um, we have an event and that has all the details there as well as there's a link. So we are asking people to register um, through, we have a Google form. So if you go on the event and click on tickets, it'll bring you right there. And it's going to be a free event, but we will um, be having a $5 fee for um, the dinner portion of it, but if that is something that is going to be a barrier, we also have a scholarship option that you can mark because we don't want cost to be a barrier for anyone to be able to attend the summit. We just are doing this so that we can have better numbers um, for getting the right amount of food for sure. everyone. Um, what or who has inspired your all's work in MPIRG and your interest in the environment and climate change? Um, for me, past leaders in MPIRG, um, environmental activists in the community and on campus, <clears throat> but also the people who are just coming to the weekly meetings who are bringing issues forward that like I didn't know about, you know, um, just learning, I guess, from every everybody around me. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And for you, Stan, what or who inspires you? Um, well, I think that was really good, the like past leaders and just seeing their, like listening to them talk and hearing about their passion, but like you said, it really is like the members that come that are just really excited to use MPIRC to facilitate like 
creating bigger change and just seeing someone when you see people for the first time that are like that are realizing that they can make change and they want to and they're excited and they want to go out and create an event but if I'm being really honest Tone you are a huge inspiration to me and you have been ever since last year when you came and you spoke um, so eloquently at our Emperor meeting um, it's people it's people like you that have ded dedicated their lives to this um, it just makes me think like I can do more and it inspires me to be better every day. Okay, that was unexpected, but <laughs> thank you. Um, in the past year, who are some of the people that you've met in Duluth that have inspired you, either through specific events or uh, conferences, gatherings? You've mentioned a few, but are there anyone in particular that you've really been inspired by that you've watched this past year in Duluth? Yeah, I think um, probably every single one of the community events or meetings that I've been to. Um, the leaders for Duluth Climate Mobilization, that's very inspiring because, I don't know, like you're, I don't know, you're doing it, you know what I mean? Like they're making um, the way. Going back to last fall, I remember, um, I believe it was you and I and maybe someone else, we had a meeting with John Doberstein from Duluth for Clean Water and I just remember coming out of that meeting feeling really inspired and like we could do anything and I just, I think every time I like, that specific example with John, it's just every time I have a conversation with a community leader in an organization about like the possibilities of an event or the possibilities of the future, um, I was able to go to a Minnesota Power meeting about um, their IRP for coming up this fall and um, Laura Wedge and Jenny Akel and Eric Enberg all were in the car that I carpooled there uh, to Chisholm uh, with and just the conversations on the way there and then the conversations on the way back um, reflecting on what we had heard and the discussions that we'd had it was really wonderful to just hear three grown adults that were so um, engaged and wanting to do more and we can change this um, because like coming from my small town again it's just there really isn't that sense of urgency and there's like there's no activist group in my town of 1300 and so being able to like listen to adults that are so passionate and giving so much of their time um, I think that yeah those conversations have really inspired me to be able to do more okay when you look at Duluth in this region, what do you think are some of the challenges we're facing and or opportunities? Anything in particular that you all can think about? I think Duluth is classified as a city that people will come to when climate change starts to get really rough. So I think if we're going to be talking about that, we need to be making the steps to make our city, you know, safe when climate change does start to affect us more. That would be the like the main thing for me that I think. Okay. I think a big issue too is that it's a lot of big scale like changes that we have to make. So I guess like going off of the meeting from like Minnesota Power specifically, um, just like knowing about their plans for the Namaji gas plant in Superior and then um, learning more about like the realities of the hydro that we're going to be getting from Manitoba and how that's affecting native communities and I think like for me um, I'm in a class called energy culture and society it's an anthropology class that's focused on understanding the intricacies of the grid um, just learning a lot more about it it's really it is like a big issue on how we get our energy that that fuels our everyday lives. And mm -hmm. so I think that like making that transition to renewables is really important. And it seems like there's a lot of pushback from um, these like big companies such as Minnesota Power in like moving forward on that. And so I think that like my, my one of my big concerns is like trying to get community members like rallied together to hold them accountable and to be able to like go forward with renewables and towards the future instead of, um, going backwards like with the Namaji right. gas plant and stuff like that um but it's just really I think the issue is that everyone um the hard-working people that are going to be most affected and are most affected by climate change are just trying to put food on the table and so it's hard to take a lot of time out of your life to be able to dedicate to this when you're just trying to survive um especially when it comes to like low-income people or um, people of color that are experiencing like all the things uh, coming with climate change um, it's just it's really hard and so it's trying to be able to rally people together but then also understanding the limitations of kind of like 
how much extra time people have to do that and just knowing like as a like a privileged person to be able to use my time to try and affect change okay um i know i spent a lot of time at umd and there's some great people there uh, who are some of the people at umd that you all work with and or will be at the summit that you know of for me um the first one that comes to mind is one of my professors Teresa bertassi um, she's a new professor at UMD, but she's my favorite by far. Really? <laughs> yeah, okay. she really brings her personal experiences into the classroom, which I think is something that is unique and not done a lot in education. But um, yeah, she brings she brings a lot of new perspectives. She's going to be a breakout leader at the summit. Okay, That's good. exciting. Another one is Libby Ben, as um, Stina mentioned earlier. Right. Um, she's an amazing speaker for Duluth for Clean Water. And one of my <laughs> professors, Catherine Millen, is going to be at the summit. Um, working on a, a breakout around issues that she's worked on um, and about the grid and how we get our energy and stuff like that. And then um, the Office of Sustainability is going to be there doing a breakout on renewable or make your own products and such, um, as well as the Swenson College of Science and Engineering outreach team is actually a sponsor and they're gonna be bringing a group of middle schoolers to talk about a solar project that they are working on as well. Um, so we're really having good engagement with the people on campus and excited to engage both students and as well as professors in our summit. I know in conversations you all talked about reaching out to high school students since last year. What are some of the efforts that you're gonna to try to do to reach out to high school students? Anything in particular? Or, yeah. So, um, I guess going back to Emperor in general, we have um, a board, and so right now one of our new initiatives is to get high school students on that board. So um, we have a high school student from East as as well as from Harbor City School, and we're working with Helen Klana, who's a senior at Denfeld, um, to be able to make those community connections in order to have them working closely with our leaders to be able to help plan things like the environmental summit and having all the stakeholders involved when doing um, such big work that affects them as well especially because they're doing such great work um, with the climate strikes and everything and acknowledging their work um, and including them in that conversation so um, yeah we're really excited to have MPERG, um, MPERG students working directly with the high school people through our board. Okay. Out of curiosity, what are your all's plans after college? I remember I had some interesting answers from Izzy when she was on the show. But for yourselves, if you have any thoughts about what you'd like to do after you leave the university? or um, I think I'm going to be in Duluth for a little bit after I graduate. And ideal, ideal situation, I would like to keep working with um, some type of environmental group, similar to Emperor, either doing activist work or advocacy work or something, working with the community. Um, but nothing set in stone yet. Okay. And I kind of have a wide range of <laughs> interests and um, I'll be having some experiences this summer that will help me kind of narrow down exactly what I want to do. So um, this summer I'm going to be going on a archaeological dig because I got into anthropology initially because I really wanted to be an archaeologist. So um, I have some connections um, through family at the university in Oslo in Norway. Mm. And so I'm really excited in pursuing a master's degree there, either in cultural anthropology or archaeology. But I also am heavily exploring kind of the area of working um, in some way on campus with students because um, being able to work with people like Jenny Eltink, who's the director for Kirby, Kirby Student Center, um, and Lisa Irwin, who's the vice chancellor for um, student life at UMD, I really, I really appreciate that the work that they're doing. And I think it's really important because it's such a pivotal moment for so many people going to get their undergraduate degree and being able to help that experience um, be as good as it can be as well as giving people opportunities to grow and I've had the opportunity to grow through MPERG as a student group and so just being able to work with students that in that way and help them achieve their goals um, that's another avenue that I'm higher education trying to um, I'm just trying to narrow down what exactly I want to do but I'm really excited for everything coming up in the next year I keep forgetting, I think you're, always think you're a senior, but you're a junior this yeah. year, right? Mm -hmm. and I'm a junior. What year are you, Kayla? I'm a senior, you're but a senior? I'll be graduating in December. Okay. Um, I really want to thank Kayla and Stina with being, with being with us today and look forward to joining them at the summit on March 26th. 
And as always, I'd like to end with a quote uh, from Greta Thunberg's book, No One is Too Small to Make a Difference. And I think her quote is appropriate given the upcoming conference, Our Planet, Our Future. Uh, this was before the Houses of Parliament in London in April of 2019. Can you hear me? My name is Greta Thunberg. I'm 16 years old. I come from Sweden and I speak on behalf of future generations. I know many of you don't want to listen to us. You say we're just children, but we're only repeating the message of the United Climate Science. Many of you appear concerned that we're wasting valuable lesson time, but I assure you we will go back to school the moment you start listening to science and give us a future. Is it really that uh, too much to ask? Many people say that we don't have any solutions to the climate crisis, and they're right because how could we? How do you solve the greatest crisis that humanity has ever faced? How do you solve a war? How do you solve going to the moon for the first time? How do you solve inventing new inventions? The climate crisis is both the easiest and the hardest issue we've ever faced. The easiest because we know what we must do. We must stop the emissions of greenhouse gases. The hardest because our current economics are still totally dependent on burning fossil fuels and thereby destroying ecosystems in order to create everlasting economic growth. So exactly how do we solve that, you ask? The children are striking for the climate. Avoiding climate breakdown will require cathedral thinking. We must lay the foundation while we may not know exactly how to build the ceiling. Sometimes we just simply have to find a way. The moment we decide to fulfill something, we can do anything. And I'm sure that the moment we start behaving as if we were in an emergency, we can avoid climate and ecological catastrophe. Humans are very adaptable. We can still fix this, but the opportunity to do so will not last for so long. We must start today. We have no more excuses. Take care.